Hello there, my YouTube chums. Today you find me playing Kuru Kuru Kururin. And just try saying that after a stiff pims. <laughs> this game, developed by Ating, was a launch title for Nintendo's Game Boy Advance back in 2001. There is a story wrapped around this game, but the actual aim is to guide one's spinning sticks of various lengths around a series of devilishly difficult courses. One stick can touch the sides only three times before it's all over, bar the gnashing of teeth and frustrated wailing. Playing this handheld classic puts me in mind of Fortescue Village's most recent May Day celebrations. It is traditionally one of the most important days in the calendar in our village. This year's May Day Fortescue Village fate was to raise money for repairs to our church roof and was organised by our Women's Activities Guild or WAGs, as we affectionately call them. Although their intentions are always well-meaning, their modus operandi is to plan with military precision. This formidable army of females is admired and feared in equal measure by all. The volunteers of the village had been given strict instructions to assemble bright and early that morning on the village green in order to set up their stands, stores and trestles along with any accompanying whatnots. There were all manner of attractions and entertainments. Bunty and I were manning the Fortescue Bouncy Towers. Arabella was running the Pin the Tail on the Donkey stall. The vicar was selling raffle tickets. His wife was peddling hot dogs, while Melissa, Malty Milburn's wife, was hawking the homemade honey. Malty himself took great pride in running his stall. He had created a special loop and wire contraption. It consisted of an enormous copper wire, along the convoluted length of which the punter had to manoeuvre a loop. The loop was not allowed to touch the wire. If it did, there was a buzz. It was game over. No three strikes here. To personalise it, Malty had fashioned the wire into the shape of the Snowdonia mountain range. Oh, it, it's not just an approximation, Malty explained. It's an entirely accurate recreation. I know those mountains like the back of my hand. I spent much of my boyhood scrambling up the slippery screes and pickaxing my way up perilous rock faces. To add an extra frisson to the proceedings and to surprise the unsuspecting, Malty had also incorporated a mild electric shock into the machinery as well as an ear-shattering buzzer. Oh, I've upped the ante a little, <laughs> and upped the voltage, <laughs> chuckled Morty. My model will be character building, unlike your standard user-friendly models with the diddy little buzzers. The fate was opened at midday by the vicar, and all was going like clockwork until well into the afternoon. Around tea time, however, the first whispers of a breeze could be felt gentle at first, just billowing the frills of the stall covers and blowing the bunting about. Then, before one could say, well, this wasn't forecast, a somewhat more insistent wind whipped up and began tormenting all and sundry. The bouncy castle wobbled worryingly from side to side. Candy floss was flying into faces. And, to top it all, the takings had taken off and were fluttering skywards. What was to become of the church roof now? As if this wasn't enough, the crowd's attention was then drawn to a kerfuffle over at the dancing around the Maypole event. The dance had been going like a dream, with the dancers gliding their ribbons under and over, swaying and swirling, creating a vibrant, ribbony thing of beauty. Suddenly, however, Tizer Tompkins started to lose his rhythm. A swarm of bees had made a beeline for him and had momentarily invaded Tizer's personal space, causing him to duck and dive, bob and weave, twist and turn with calamitous yet comedic consequences. All eyes were on Tizer, as he had somehow entangled himself into an elaborate bow. <laughs> it was truly a bafflement to behold. The entire dance formation had gone into meltdown, with layer upon layer of tangles. The whole thing looked like some sort of modern art installation. <laughs> Despite the chaos unfolding all around, 
Even the wags saw the funny side, and led the crowd in a three-cheered salute to Tizer, who in response gave an elaborate bow. <laughs> Meanwhile, Malty was becoming perplexed. He had had no punters for his very scary-looking loop-and-wire double-dare challenge. Also, as the wind gathered pace, it began to play havoc with his tarpaulin. Losing patience, he checked that the coast was clear, grabbed his loop-and-wire device, and made a dash for it, sneaking into the puzzled peacock. One of the wags, who had been distracted by the maple debacle, returned to discover Malty missing. Yes, Malty had willfully and wantonly abandoned his post. Malty's absconded! She bellowed. Oh, he'll have popped to the pub, said Melissa helpfully. The wags marched over to investigate. Inside the puzzle peacock, Malty's loop and wire challenge had drawn such a crowd that the bar was bursting at the seams and the throng had spilled over into the beer garden outside. As the locals had become more and more merry, so the contraption had become more and more of a challenge. It seems the challenge was much more attractive when one was filled with a little liquid bravado. It was, however, a case of diminishing returns, as the competitors' coordination became increasingly impaired. As the drinks flowed, so Malty's taking swelled. Malty turned out to be the hero of the hour! The church roof can't be saved after all! The wags and the rest of the company toasted cheers to Malty and his almost certainly illegal, health and safety defying, near death trap, loop and wire, double dare challenge. If you've enjoyed this video, please subscribe, like me, tell your friends. Until next time, this is Lord Fortescue saying, Toodle Pipsy and. <coughs> oh, my YouTube chums!